This episode is brought to you by the SIBO Recovery Roadmap Course, created by Dr. Allison Seebecker and myself, Siobhan Sarna. Hi. <laughs> the SIBO Recovery Roadmap Course is a self-led, at-your-own-pace online course that teaches you how to treat and beat SIBO. As a SIBO patient myself, I know how overwhelming and confusing SIBO can be. And that's why we created the SIBO Recovery Roadmap Course. There are more than 30 lessons on every topic, from getting tested to interpreting those test results to prescriptions and herbal treatments, and even how to keep from relapsing. It is loaded with information, and we keep updating it all the time. Learn more about the SIBO Recovery Roadmap Course at SIBOSOS.com slash SIBO Recovery Roadmap slash. Hi, and welcome back to the SIBO SOS podcast. I'm Siobhan Sarna, your host. And today I have a very special presentation for you. Dr. Leonard Weinstock is our guest. Dr. Weinstock is a board certified physician in gastroenterology and internal medicine. He's a professor at the Institute of Functional Medicine and on the board of the LDN Research Trust. We are so fortunate to have him as a guest. Today, you're going to hear a very juicy conversation that Dr. Weinstock and I had about SIBO, that small intestine bacterial overgrowth, restless leg syndrome, LDN, low-dose naltrexone, autoimmunity, and so much more. He personally has transformed my health. Let's get to the interview and see what he can do for you today. We have an expert who is a gastroenterologist as well as a textbook contributor, as well as a gentleman who is an expert in SIBO, LDN, restless leg, rosacea, and all kinds of things associated with that. I wish he lived closer to me so he could be one of my doctors. He's here with us right now at the SIBO SOS Summit to share some of his insights and wisdom. Thank you, Dr. Weinstock, for being here. Hello, hello. Hello, Siobhan. Nice to see you again. It's been great to to talk to you in the past. Thank you. I'm still utilizing a lot of the advice that you gave me, and it really moved me forward, so I really appreciate it. I want to talk to you about the relationship between SIBO and restless leg syndrome, because you totally opened my eyes up to the fact that I probably have it. So if it's happening to me, chances are it's happening to other people. Could you um, take us on that journey, sir? Absolutely. Uh, Well, actually, This was a topic of conversation. One of the presentations I gave at the SIBO conference just recently in Chicago, and it just woke people up to say, okay, maybe I've got it, or I know people who have it. It's really common. 7% to 10% of the population have restless leg syndrome. And this is a condition where where there is a compelling urge to move your leg. So it's not the toe tapping with nervous people. It's not the kicking at night, although I'll talk about that later. It's a compelling urge to move, usually associated with discomfort in the legs. It can be in the arms as well, but usually the legs. It's usually symmetrical as opposed to something like sciatica, which bothers you when you're lying down and your back is getting scrunched and the nerves getting pinched. No, this is more of a uh, diffuse uh, leg discomfort um, with um, creepy crawly feeling, tingling. Sometimes people say it's hard to describe. It's just uncomfortable. There's the urge to move, which is worse in the evening and gets worse towards bedtime. And people get up and walk around and that relieves them while they're walking around. So in 16... Uh, 16, 1655, there was a textbook where they were called the night walkers. And so this is really almost exactly um, the experience that they had. They're, basically, it was called their uh, night of torture because they couldn't sleep. Now, I talked to you earlier about um, growing pains in kids. Could that also be uh, a restless leg syndrome in kids? Absolutely. My research partner down in Vanderbilt, Arthur Walters, described restless leg syndrome um, in children as part of the growing pain phenomenon. And there uh, we have to think, well, how would you look at restless leg syndrome? So there's primary restless leg syndrome, like those kids who are growing and having basically restless leg syndrome. There's familial restless leg syndrome, and clearly there's um, 
genetic markers and sometimes some of these markers relate to iron absorption which is part and parcel of restless leg syndrome sometimes it's a inflammatory gene that uh, regulates inflammation and that's yet again something we're interested and then finally there's secondary restless leg syndrome so there's 50 uh, reported conditions in the literature uh, where different diseases, conditions, um, and situations, you know, ranging from pregnancy to uh, uh, po post-polio syndrome, um, whereby um, they're associated with restless leg syndrome. Who knew? And so do they know the connection between, for example, SIBO and restless leg? I mean, is there a direct, obvious correlation with the science, or is that a little bit of a scientific mystery? Well, in 2005, that's when I really got interested in this. I was taking care of my cousin who had severe restless leg syndrome and mild irritable bowel syndrome. And what we learned at a conference is that um, many people with irritable bowel syndrome had post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. Ultimately, now we know that there's an autoimmune antibody that destroys the nervous system of the gut causing poor emptying of the gut at night. The small intestine is sluggish and bacteria build up and cause SIBO. And that's the autoimmune anti-vinculin story, which I'm sure many of your listeners know about. But if you need more information, we can talk about that. So anyway, my cousin uh, went off, got a, an infection in Europe, and then got irritable bowel syndrome and restless leg syndrome, and had a hard time sleeping, and it was really a major problem for him. So at the meeting, uh, Dr. Pimentel was talking about fibromyalgia, and many of those patients had a positive breath test and significant bacterial overgrowth. And at the meeting, I was thinking to myself, well, if post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome was associated with fibromyalgia, could it be associated with restless leg syndrome? And so I started testing and treating patients uh, who had irritable bowel initially with restless leg syndrome and watched them got, get better. And in fact, uh, my cousin got better um, and he responded to the broad spectrum antibiotic that's not absorbed rifaximin and he did really well. And um, so that started my whole research endeavors and looking at the relationship between SIBO. And then when I joined forces with Dr. Walters, he said, let's expand this. Yes, you know, I understand your point that SIBO is associated with systemic inflammation, and that might be associated with um, transportation of iron into the brain. But let's think about immune phenomenon. Let's think about other things um, that could explain this condition. So let's talk about the immune aspect of that with the IBS check. Can you explain that? Because you did such a great job when we were talking about it beforehand, and I want everyone to hear your, yeah. your explanation. Okay. So the story started in 2002. Um, Dr. Pimentel and Dr. Lin studied the motility of their IBS patients. Uh, especially those who had SIBO, and their migrating motor complex went away or got very weak. And the migrating motor mo complex is something that turns on in your GI tract, starting in the stomach, going down through into the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And it's a powerful sweeper way to clean out the GI tract every 90 minutes when you're fasting, which, of course, mainly is at night while you're sleeping. And so um, their patients lost that wave or became very weak. And through um, the years of research, they found out by giving rats Campylobacter bacteria that many of them developed uh, bacterial overgrowth and irritable bowel syndrome, the poor rats, and unfortunately, they did, but they got um, evaluation of their bacterial counts. They were high, and they did electron microscopy to look at the nerves, and the nerves in the GI tract for those rats who got SIBO 
uh, were damaged. And so that correlated, therefore, with the idea that the migrating motor mo complex was also getting damaged in, a, in an adult people. And so what he did was he looked at blood from adults with bacterial overgrowth and irritable bowel syndrome and did studies on various antibodies. And he found that the antibodies produced by four particular bacteria, Campylobacter, E. coli, Yersinia, Shigella, Salmonella, pardon me, five, and also we've learned C. difficile, that's six, that those bacteria create an antibody called CBD4 because they make CBD4 toxin. And CBD4 triggers another immune phenomenon that is creation of antivincoolin. And antivincoolin works against the nerves. And so it damages the interstitial cells of Cajal which are the key mediators to get your migrating motor complex going. So if you damage your nerves through autoimmune antibodies, you don't get your uh, migrating motor complex at night. The bacteria build up, they uh, go up into the small intestine, or they come down from the upper GI tract and they multiply, they adhere to the small intestine, they create inflammation. They're there sitting there waiting for your food to digest. And all of a sudden, you're a Anheuser-Busch factory, fermenting sugars and carbohydrates with the bacteria. And you can have yeast there as well. Okay, so that really explains when people are talking about how SIBO is possibly uh, or is an autoimmune issue. That's exactly what they're talking about, right? So Correct. That was Correct. a perfect, perfect explanation. Thank you. I want to talk about LDN, low-dose naltroxone, which you are an expert in and have written a book on and has been, for so many people, incredibly helpful. And other people, they've never heard of it before. So what, what, right. is, your, what is your introduction to LDN and how can it help us? Okay. Well, I started using this in 2005. A compounding pharmacist came over to the office and said, Dr. Weinstein, you might find this compound interesting. And it goes back to 1984 when Dr. Bilhari in New York needed something to treat his patients. He was taking care of patients with HIV, AIDS, multiple sclerosis, and cancer. And as an internist, he didn't have much to offer them, but he was uh, a thinker. He thinks that he thought out of the box. Um, and unfortunately, he didn't publish much of his work at all. A lot of it just stayed on the internet and in his own writings, but unfortunately, it was never published. But what he found was that it improved the immunity, it regulated the immunity, it decreased autoimmune disease, and it helped treat cancer. Um, and we know that a lot of cancers are regulated by the immune system. And so this start led to other people applying it to other conditions. And so it's really been a um, thing that spread by word. So it's, I call it a grassroots movement. So um, people have learned about it. Our friend in England, Linda, um, started the um, LDNResearchTrust.org because she had severe MS. She went to her GP. She went to her um, specialists in MS, and they said, there's nothing more we can do for you. You've tried the drugs. There's nothing else. So she went to the internet, and she found LDN, and she basically turned her life around by getting a doctor to prescribe it for her, and she went from being almost wheelchair-bound to being the most energetic woman that I know, um, other than you, Siobhan, but um, you're neck and neck. And anyway, um, she is there as an educator to, you know, interview patients, um, to basically report on 177 different applications that patients, doctors, and pharmacists have said, uh, well, LDN works in this situation. And 
There are reports, there are double-blind placebo-controlled studies in Crohn's disease and in fibromyalgia, and in an exciting study to be published shortly by Dr. Um, um, Jared Younger and his associates, it shows that the um, cytokines, the inflammatory chemicals in patients who have fibromyalgia go down with LDN, which is really dramatic. That is exactly what's happened to me. I was going to the chiropractor once a week, twice a week, emergency, migraine, had to go, or um, I was getting physical therapy, I was getting acupuncture, and I still do that, but it is not like running my life. I'm not spending a fortune at it anymore. I feel so much better. And I tried to do the LDN um, a couple of times and just, I didn't, I didn't really feel the benefit. Maybe I did because what happened was I got so many weird dreams. I had just so many vivid dreams that I wasn't sleeping. But then after talking to you in our, our last interview, um, I was like, okay, I got to try this again. And I started with a very small dose and built up. And even though I'm not up to that ideal dosage yet, which I hope you'll share with everyone, I have to say this is the longest stretch in 10 years where my inflammation and my psoriasis are now uh, greatly diminished to the point of where it's not constantly on my mind and constantly, you know, distracting and being so uncomfortable. So thank you, Dr. Weinstock. <laughs> I'm You're very welcome. enthusiastic about sharing the word with everybody. So indirectly, you're my second patient I've treated with psoriasis. The first is doing unbelievable, uh, amazing response. And it's an autoimmune condition and inflammatory too. And it's just, and I had fibromyalgia for sure. Absolutely. Um, Did the steroid shots. I mean, just so many confusing um, episodes of... I don't want to say misdiagnosis, but more like, oh, a lot of body work, a lot of effort, and nothing was really a permanent fix. Nothing really permanently helped me until now. And so, you know, it's really like, it's really been quite the miracle for me. What is the ideal dose for people? And what if they're like me and had the vivid dreams and, and why does that happen? And what should we do about it? Right. So what you're getting is endorphins, and endorphins get the brain excited, um, and that's part of the issue with this drug. Um, I do have some interesting ideas regarding that, which I'll share, but um, what you're doing is you're um, fooling the body into tricking the body into making more endorphins. The naltrexone is an anti-narcotic, and I emphasize that because Everybody hears about naltrexone and the, you know, the indication is treating narcotic abuse and alcohol abuse with 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams. But when you're treating um, patients with inflammatory and autoimmune conditions or cancer, the dose is between 1 and 4.5 milligrams. Ideally, you start with a very low dose at night and work your way up. You're trying to capture... Um, there's a cat walking across your screen. Um, sorry, I had to say that. Um, anyway, um, you're working up so people can tolerate it. Um, if you slam somebody with 4.5 milligrams, which is, we think, the ideal dose for inflammation and Crohn's disease and for painful condition uh, like fibromyalgia, you're just going to have a dropout rate of 15 to 20%. And that's what um, studies show. And um, so now I'm actually starting people off at one milligram every three to four to five to seven days, increasing by one milligram until they get up to four. And then I switch them over to 4.5. That said, I think different diseases respond differently. In the study that I published in the LDN book, um, it shows that 2.5 2.5 was better than uh, 4.5 in my restless leg syndrome patients. Um, let me reflect on that by also saying that restless leg syndrome patients have endorphin deficiency. 
And Dr. Walters proved that in looking at um, autopsy specimens of patients who had died, had restless leg syndrome, and he counted the endorphins and metencephalins in the brain and found that they were less than in people who had died of natural causes and did not have restless leg syndrome. And so um, there's the interaction with endorphins, low brain iron, and dopamine function. And if you don't have the endorphins and you don't have enough iron, the dopamine doesn't work well, and that's why you have restless leg syndrome. And so um, what I do now is I work up gradually. I work up more quickly if I've got a patient with severe ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease and needs the therapy right away. The patients with uh, fibromyalgia, they've had it for a long time. I'm going to try to tune up their gut, the SIBO, the um, leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability, if you will. And then I'm going to gradually work up the dose so that they feel better, uh, they can tolerate it better, they can tolerate that endorphin activity. If, however, they have insomnia and it just doesn't get better with melatonin, then I will say, okay, let's switch it to morning time. And, you know, it may or may not have the diurnal or circadian kick to the endorphin cells uh, that nighttime dosing does, but Let's try it in the morning. And usually people will respond and do pretty well. What about one in the morning and one at night? So you want to balance things out. Um, So you really want that temporary uh, blocking. The four to six hours where the naltrexone binds to the endorphin cell. The endorphin cell says, hey, we're not making enough endorphins. I'm not seeing enough endorphins. The receptors are not seeing um, their own endorphins, and they're saying, okay, the nucleus starts producing more and more growth factor, and then the receptors are increasing in number, and then the naltrexone comes off because it's small dose, and then the cell starts producing more endorphins, and you get a 15-fold increase in endorphins, and you have more receptors. And so the cells are more active and therefore you don't want to blunt that by doing a second dose. Okay. So with this, when you talk about endorphins and dopamine, would this also lead to an overall improvement of a feeling of well-being? Very much so. I, you know, it's really interesting how brain fog gets better. I I'm writing a paper um, with a, uh, biostatistician, and um, we have noted um, the brain fog definitely gets better in a condition called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And I just emailed a patient who has mast cell activation syndrome and a little bit of POTS, but mainly mast cell, and her brain fog got dramatically better with LDN. And so is it reducing the inflammation that's bogging up the uh, pathways? Uh, we have um, these glial cells, um, which are the inflammatory cells. So I want to talk about fibro for just a little bit. Part of fibro, part of uh, complex regional pain syndrome is the activated white blood cells called the glial cells that sit on top of the sensory nerves in the brain and the spinal canal. And the spinal column, where we have the nerves coming out, these are sensory nerves. And they're highly activated when the glial cells are activated. And the naltrexone binds to a receptor on those glial cells and settles them down. So they bind to the toll receptors and settle the uh, glial cells, which decreases, quote, neuroinflammatory pain. And by doing so, uh, patients have less pain, less fibro, which I'm so happy to hear that you're doing better. And I just uh, want to tell everybody out there, if you have a doctor that tells you fibromyalgia is in your head or complex regional pain syndromes in your head, get a different doctor. That's profound and very powerful. And 
I hope people listen to you so they don't feel trapped. And I, you know, the thing that happened to me is that I had um, a lot of steroid shots because they, I was just told there was nothing you could do about it. So it was really a revelation when I heard about how LDN could help. So we've talked about something a couple of times you've touched on it, which is the iron in the brain. So I want to talk about that and how the iron count or the iron levels, anemia, low ferritin and all that can impact your um, overall well-being, your SIBO, and why people are often um, receiving iron drips when they have SIBO. Okay. So interesting. Well, you know, actually, if you look at most patients with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and irritable bowel syndrome, most of those people have normal blood iron. However, patients with restless leg syndrome have less. Now, some of these patients may have SIBO, some may not, because I treat some patients who have a positive breath test with uh, Rifaximin followed by um, LDN, or if they're, um, they don't have SIBO, I just treat them with LDN alone. But I also give iron therapy, um, <clears throat> pardon me, and we think that the inflammation of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth increases a hormone produced by the liver called hepcidin. And that hepcidin uh, decreases the activity of the um, absorption of iron and the transportation of iron. And so hepcidin may decrease the transportation of iron into the brain. The iron, uh, poor brain, uh, results in poor dopamine functioning. You don't have enough um, opioids in the brain. That worsens the whole scenario. Now, I do have an amazing patient who has severe SIBO um, in the setting of Crohn's disease. The Crohn's disease became inactive. She had a lot of adhesions from um, a perforation, and she developed SIBO and severe iron deficiency. And she uh, didn't have the issue of irritable bowel with absent migrating motor complex. She had trapped small bowel that actually got better with a uh, physical therapy technique um, where they kind of massaged out and t- uh, got rid of the adhesion so the small bowel could be more active. And only with that did she gain weight and her iron levels came up. Um, that said, you know, we have a spectrum of severe diseases like small bowel pseudoobstruction and scleroderma where iron deficiency is a true phenomenon. How does the iron deficiency that you were just referring to also relate to like low ferritin levels? Because you can have, like you can not be anemic, but still have low ferritin. Is, is that a true statement? Oh, that's very true. So there's studies by Dr. Sun years ago showing that anybody who had a ferritin between 50 and 20, which is the lower end of normal, had severe restless leg syndrome. And when they gave them intravenous iron by infusions, the iron level went up, namely the ferritin went up, and there was a significant reduction in, ther- uh, in severity of restless leg syndrome. So iron infusions by itself can improve restless leg syndrome by 62%. Wow. And let's just define what, what ferritin is and how that plays a role with the blood. Ferritin is a uh, chemical that we measure in the uh, bloodstream that is reflective of total body iron. It's, um, you know, you can measure iron with iron and transferrin and iron saturation. <clears throat> if it gets, if the iron uh, saturation gets low enough and the f- ferritin gets low enough, the bone marrow doesn't have enough iron to feed the uh, precursors to red blood cells, and then you become anemic. But first thing that happens, let's say you've got celiac disease, you're not absorbing iron because of the disease of the small intestine, your iron level goes down before you get anemic. Okay. Okay. And so when people have these iron infusions, like let's talk about the difference between iron infusions and taking iron orally. Okay. 
So when you have very severe iron deficiency, um, the fastest way to get it up is by putting it right into the bloodstream. Um, it takes, uh, you know, you can use a uh, venifer or uh, injectifer if you've got certain conditions that insurance will cover. And those are the most rapid ways to get it up. Are there five infusions or furlicet is another one, which is five infusions. <clears throat> and those will work very rapidly because they circulate and go to the bone marrow. Uh, the problem with oral is, um, A, um, constipation is a problem. B, if you're um, inflamed, you're not necessarily going to absorb things. So people with Crohn's disease where they're ulcerated um, or, um, or patients who have, let's say, low um, acid levels in the stomach, uh, that's a definite cause for iron malabsorption, Crohn's disease, uh, celiac disease in the upper small bowel. Those are definitely problems because it's really the iron gets absorbed from the upper small intestine, namely the duodenum primarily. So those patients with duodenal ulcers or bleeding, severe inflammation, um, uh, these are the conditions that can lead to iron deficiency where it's hard for a patient to absorb iron by mouth. So when we're looking at, um, when we're looking at, I'm back to LDN for a second. When we're looking at LDN, you know, a lot of, we hear LDN as a potential prokinetic after um, SIBO treatment. What's been your experience with LDN as low-dose naltrexone as a prokinetic in addition to or versus all of the other things that we've been talking about with LDN? Well, I am studying that now, and it's just taking time to gather the data. My over feeling, uh, overview of it is that uh, studies have been done showing uh, it works in uh, human volunteers when um, the net product, metenkeflin, is given intravenously. This was a, long, a long time ago, a study showed that it worked to increase the migrating motor complex. And then if you're a chicken, um, it works pretty well, too, uh, that's been studied. Um, and overall, in a, humans, uh, it is partly effective, but often I'll wind up giving uh, low dose erythromycin or procalipride by mouth at night to be more potent. Okay, and so can we just define um, prokinetics? They're, they activate the migrating motor complex, right? When our bodies are doing. Overall, you know, prokinetic means uh, stimulatory, proactive pro-muscular or neuromuscular activity of the intestine. So it's something that stimulates the activity. And, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of great safe prokinetics. But uh, although the ones I mentioned, low-dose erythromycin and low-dose procalipride, which is available from Canada, are safe. Okay. When, when, so when you're doing the LDN, that don't count on it necessarily as your main prokinetic after you do the treatment. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, I know you talked to me about uh, an, a way to get LDN if your doctor's not familiar with it, or um, that there was a website with a doctor that, that helped people out with that. Can you Correct. elaborate? So, yes. I think the doctor is listed on both LDNscience.org for sure. And I believe it listed on LDNResearchTrust.org. However, um, on each one, they show a listing by state, city, and country of doctors who will prescribe. Okay. All right, good. So that's going to be a great resource for everybody to, to try yeah. to get a hold of it if you're interested. You know, when we go to our doctors and they do blood work on us. Do you have a particular list of things to have um, when to have checked when patients come to see you at presenting with SIBO that may be a little bit different than the usual, you know, CBC and all that jazz? Do you have some other tests? Do you like run B12? Do you run vitamin D? What can people ask their doctors for in addition to the standard operating procedure of blood tests? Well, it's certainly true that uh, vitamin D is essential as an anti-inflammatory and a regulatory protein and possibly an anti-cancer uh, vitamin. However, it's really important in restless leg syndrome. So my RLS patients come in, they get a ferritin, they get a vitamin D level. 
Um, with respect to patients who are malnourished, um, I check their fat-soluble uh, vitamins. So that's A, D, E, and K. So you can get A, D, E levels, and then you can get a prothrombin time to look at the vitamin K effect on the body. Um, you know, if somebody's really been losing weight, you want to get albumin and pre-albumin levels. Uh, that's very helpful. And cholesterol profile. If your cholesterol is very low, you know, you're sick. Um, so those are some things. And then I often do a screen for patients with diarrhea with a C-reactive protein, the CRP, which is probably better than the sedimentation rate, looking for inflammatory conditions. And then finally, um, to look for inflammation of the gut lining, there's a non-invasive fecal test called the fecal calprotectin. And, and is that is that a stool test or is that a blood test? That's a stool. So okay. the a fecal specimen is brought in, you know, um, in the specimen uh, container sent to the lab and you have this inflammatory marker called the calprotectin level and it can be very sensitive um, and so you don't have to be getting colonoscopies every uh, six months to learn what's going on, you can use that plus symptoms to know whether you're getting better or not. So if there is inflammation that's actually shown, not just assumed, right? Uh, what can we do for that? Would that also be like an LDN possibility? Well, I strongly be believe that LDN helps the gut barrier improve. It reduces inflammation. See, once you start getting damage to the lining, you get an enteropathy of one type or another, and you damage the cells, then uh, basically the uh, increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut occurs. You get um, basically um, bacterial byproducts going down into the lamina propria or the area right below the mucosa. That brings in uh, cells. Um, because the dendritic cells get inflamed and that calls in um, T cells and T cells bring in um, inflammatory cytokines, which damages the lining further. And it's a vicious cycle going on. And then you get B cells, which are making antibodies, autoantibodies. And I think that's how a lot of autoimmune conditions occur. Um, and so it's, as a lot of people say, a hot mess in there. And so you can do things about that. So there's um, basically um, L-glutamine, one of the essential amino acids, the zinc. Um, there's um, a compound um, called enterogam, which is immunoglobulins to bind the, um, the bacterial byproducts that are getting into the lining and therefore allow the body to heal itself. Um, there are other products on the marketplace. Carnosine um, is one. And, and then, of course, you know, uh, dealing with the excess bacteria with antibiotic therapy and um, vitamin D to help heal. Do you ever have your patients go on a probiotic while they have SIBO? No. I wait until they are healed uh, to a certain point. I wait till the antibiotic therapy is over because I want basically the antibiotic to kill the bacteria. Now, at some point in time, uh, you know, we'll probably have a discussion about fungus, but that's a tough one. There aren't great tests to pick it up. I picked it up with some um, stool tests uh, via Genova and also by DRG lab, um, looking at the genetic uh, markers for it um, or some for stains but sometimes we just don't know those little um, candida bacteria candida fungi are just plastered on they're covered up by biofilm that they make and biofilm I'm becoming to be a believer in that it's valuable in treating the biofilm so that you can get rid of this glycoprotein that bacteria and fungi secrete, cover themselves up with, and make them immune to antibiotics and antifungal therapy. How do you, how do you break up the biofilm? Well, there are two main ones that are known, NAC, um, it's a product called Interface, and um, 
then there's a product that uh, a product that is uh, was dev- devised by a Dr. Anderson who talked at the meeting, a very brilliant naturopathic doctor who came up with a bismuth compound and other um, uh, elements that help break up um, the biofilm. And it's fairly potent. It's uh, something I use for severe cases because when you break up the biofilm, then you start exposing the bacteria, you get more die off. People have you know, symptoms uh, that have to be dealt with um, and uh, controlled by a, ver- a variety of um, things like vitamin C, high dose vitamin C. But, you know, die off is a problem early on, but you want to kill the bacteria. And so you may, if you've got a heavy load, which uh, I can often predict who's going to have trouble by the, how high their hydrogen is uh, on their breath tests. You know, those are the patients that I tell them, you know, hang in there. It's going to be tough, but, you know, this is got to, it's got to hurt to get better. <laughs> oh boy. At least the promise of getting better is there instead of just more hurt. Uh, right. I, right? Um, yeah. I'm going to try to put a link up for um, the pharmacy that compounds the um, the formula that Dr. Anderson created so that people can can reach out to that pharmacy and see if they can um, find find more information out about it and um, get a script for it. But yeah, you do need a script for that. Yeah. You can get the interface or the NAC over the counter um, through the Internet. One thing that we haven't talked about is the relationship between SIBO and rosacea. Okay. So could you highlight that for us? Because if you do have rosacea, I don't, that's one thing I don't have, but I do know um, a lot of my girlfriends have it and it's definitely, it's definitely something that bothers them. So what's the relationship there? Absolutely. Well, you know, sitting in my office, just leafing through my, American Journal of Gastroenterology in 2008, and bang, it hit me right in the eyes. Uh, Italian investigators find a relationship of rosacea uh, and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And it was a great article. And um, I read it. It was exciting uh, because at that point, uh, of course, and even now, I'm looking for any application where a syndrome can be explained. And rosacea is a symbo- sy- syndrome, basically. Um, they just have a name to it uh, that's catchy, but it could be called rosacea syndrome. Uh, because, you know, when you have a syndrome, you don't know the exact pathophysiology. It's not like having, you know, let's say renal vascular hypertension, where you know there's a particular problem, you can treat it, and you've done it. It's a disease. But syndromes are a collection of symptoms that uh, are under an umbrella and that may have multiple causes. Well, they found that 47% of their patients who were consecutively seen in their rosacea clinic had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Some of them had Helicobacter pylori, bacteria that causes ulcers, and uh, they were treated first for the Helicobacter, didn't really get better, but then when they were treated for the SIBO, uh, dramatic response, 85% got better. Um, and if the they used the antibiotic treatment for SIBO on patients with a negative breath test, they didn't get better. And then in their double-blind study, in the ones who got placebo, who had SIBO, um, and then they were given the antibiotic, they got better. And so I decided uh, to reproduce that study and basically a lot of my patients I see come in uh, from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. on a gurney into my uh, room for colonoscopy. And I look at them and I say, you know, you've got some rosacea there. Uh, has it ever been treated? And are you happy with the treatment? And uh, they say no and no. And um, so I said, well, I can offer you something. And I had them do a breath test. So 63%, 63 patients. 51% had SIBO. Wow. And of my patients, I had uh, 85% marked to moderate response with rifaximin. And then I looked at uh, patients who had um, continued to see me, and that was over 100 patients with rosacea. And if you looked at um, hydrogen and methane, um, 
I saw uh, something like 65% positive breath tests. Wow. And then finally, um, I have patients referred by ophthalmologists for ocular rosacea. And um, there it was less percent, 37% had SIBO. But many of the, the patients who were positive had a good response. And the trouble is getting the word out. Um, I have five dermatologists who see me as patients. They, get, they trust me to, get, to have me do their colonoscopy. And I gave them the Italian article. And they did nothing with it. So I called one who said, well, you know, we need more double-blind placebo-controlled studies. But in the meantime, they don't have anything that's really good. And certainly very few uh, FDA-approved drugs um, are available. It's so worth a try. It's worth a try. Um, I'll say that the, in the Italian study, the ones who had the little bumps, the papular pustulars, pustules, um, they did better than the flushing type um, and the persistent redness, but the persistent redness did get better. Um, they had some patients with ocular rosacea that got better. I, my patients with ocular rosacea got better. And it, that's terrible. It's a dry eyes and irritation in the eyes. It's, it's a real problem um, that can have significant consequences towards their vision. Is there anything that you do once somebody's come to you for SIBO, they've done a antibiotic treatment, they've maybe done it even a couple of times, they've done the repeated breath tests, and nothing really seems to resolve their SIBO. Is there something that is your go-to, one of those leave no stone unturned approaches to those cases? Well, I had a patient come in just like that a nurse um, and um, actually owned a visiting nurse um, program and very savvy, smart. And uh, she actually asked me, well, could this be fungus? And I said, well, perhaps uh, the breath test was abnormal, but I treated her for uh, CFO, uh, small intestinal fungal um, overgrowth. And she came in dramatically better, no more bloating. Uh, no more discomfort, dramatic improvement. So that made me a believer, even though there's a just 99.9% .9 of GIs thinks that um, fungus can only affect the mouth and the esophagus. But the fact is, it's not limited to that. So I'm, uh, I am a believer in that. And then also, uh, number one, uh, antibiotics may not be right for people, you know, um, uh, the Hopkins group studied um, two different combinations of uh, herbal uh, micro antimicrobials, um, not really herbal antibiotics, but herbal antimicrobials. And those worked as well as rifaximin. And um, you have to account for methane. So make sure you're getting treated for um, the methane bacteria. And then there's the, um, the biofilm equation <clears throat> that and then finally the breath test may be misread i can't tell you how many times i've uh, seen patients for third opinions and they've basically had some methane in their breath test abnormality but it was like uh you know three four 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 five five six and and uh, that's really methane probably in the colon and that's hard to treat and in the future we'll be uh, treating it in special ways, but right now we have uh, a trantal, which decreases the uh, food to the methane-producing bacteria. There are studies going on on long-acting um, lovastatin, and there's actually uh, fecal transplantation, which I'm doing for really refractory patients. Um, so giving them a whole new microbiome is How one way to think about that. How's that going? How's that going? Too early to tell. I've had uh, one patient have a dramatic response. He flared again. He got another uh, fecal transplant. He's doing great. So right now, it's just too early to tell. There are some studies on um, that are ongoing. And if you look at this website called uh, clinicaltrials.gov and you put it in FMT, you'll come up with all the things that are going on 
most of them are being directed against C. difficile, which is a major pathogen. And I, I've done, I've dealt with 60 patients with C. difficile and fecal transplant can be totally life-saving, life-altering. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. You know, you were talking about the CFO, which is the overgrowth of the fungus. Now, what is it that you do to treat that? That's, uh, as you said, it's really, really difficult. But right. what, what is your typical protocol for that? So more and more, I'm going to treat that patient with a, one of the biofilm therapies because they, the CFO, the, the uh, fungus puts out more of a covering than other than bacteria do. And so I'm going to pre-treat them with the biofilm therapy and then give them the f biofilm therapy during antibiotic treatment. So antifungal therapy, uh, fluconazole, uh, will be given uh, daily for two weeks to four weeks. Is there any, speaking of uh, drugs, is there any, um, I don't know what the word is, but um, when you are taking a drug and another drug interacts, is there any drug interactions with, for example, LDN that we should be aware of? Narcotics, number one. If you're on a narcotic, you can't take it. But other than that, nothing. You know, and, and part of the problem is if a doctor prescribes it using their um, electronic medical records, uh, the low doses of uh, naltrexone don't come up as uh, a um, warning sign for somebody who's, let's say, on codeine. So you have to look at the, make sure you're not taking narcotics. And we actually have a consent form the patient state will, will sign and state that they are not taking narcotics. Okay. If somebody wanted to become one of your patients or receive a second opinion, how can they do that other than coming to Illinois? St. Louis, uh, Missouri, Missouri. Uh, where I practice. That's Sorry. okay. Yeah. Um, so um, St. Louis is where I practice. Um, I will give um, second opinions uh, over the phone. Um, but I will not become your doctor if I haven't seen you in St. Louis. So um, that's the provision. Um, there are um, a couple of great doctors in uh, Portland that do uh, telemedicine, but also there, they're really not becoming your doctor. Now, if you know by you, your reading that you need LDN, the LDN doctor um, who does give telemedicine will actually prescribe and therefore act as your doctor. But that doctor has medical licenses in every state to be able to do that. And so there is a bit of a trick in terms of giving uh, too much advice over the phone. So it's kind of like a uh, little uh, dicey in a little bit, but a, a lot of people are doing it. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people do it and you just have to say, okay, here's the line. That's where we can't cross. Right. I think I said Illinois because I know you just did that conference in Illinois, and I was thinking yeah. about you there. <laughs> right. That's okay. Well, we're right on the border, right on the Mississippi. All right. Dr. Weinstock, thank you so much for this time that you've spent with me helping everybody and also all the things you're doing behind the scenes with your studies and with helping your patients in your practice and your textbooks, your chapters. If, if people wanted to read some information about LDN and, and your work in medical textbooks, what should they look for? So uh, go to gidoctor.net, G-I-D-O-C-T-O-R.net, and then uh, click on, on the side panel, uh, Research Publications. My, I post my lectures on PowerPoint. You have to have PowerPoint on your computer. Uh, but I post uh, important um, articles by Dr. Younger, Dr. Um, Smith, and then I post all the work that I've done, sarcoidosis, rosacea, ocular rosacea, complex regional pain syndrome. It's a game changer there. I wish more people would learn about it. Ellos Danlos, please. Uh, it is an amazing condition, um, and um, it has central sensitivity, neurosensitivity, the glial cells are activated. It's not just what's going on on the joints, although LDN can help that. But 
EDS, LS Danlos can uh, be uh, a background to uh, POTS and to mast cell activation syndrome, which can be painful and definitely be associated with SIBO. Okay, quickly, what are what is POTS and what is the mast cell um, condition that you're talking about right there? Okay, so POTS is a condition... Um, that affects one to three million uh, women primarily, some men, but it's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And by definition, if you lie down and then you stand up and your pulse goes up by 30, that's a, a very good indication that you've got this condition. And it's basically the sympathetic uh, nervous system going wild because of autoantibodies for the most part. There are some other conditions and it can be triggered by the um, HPV vaccine. It can be tr triggered by Lyme. And basically, you get these autoantibodies that trigger the sympathetic nervous system. And that is associated with many GI conditions. People have pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, I have uh, you know, patients, one patient who had such bad pelvic floor dysfunction, she got a colostomy. And basically, the sympathetic nervous system wouldn't let the anal muscle relax. And this is probably a lot more common than we see. And uh, people who have reflux, bloating, constipation, and then a host of conditions. They're not able to empty their bladder all the way. So that's all the sympathetic nervous uh, system. And... Um, and then mast cell disease, which is often associated with POTS or can run separately, is the uh, condition where the mast cell, which is the, the um, cell most well known for releasing histamine and giving you allergies and sinus and uh, rhinitis and hives, um, basically becomes overactive. And it's stimulated by a number of different things, and it can secrete 200 different mediators and this can range from um, tryptase to uh, leukotrienes which causes um, asthma to histamine which causes um, migraines and uh, increased stomach acid production and to cytokines which cause pain so uh, pain is a common phenomenon and then um, these patients have severe fatigue and a host of GI symptoms and skin problems and allergic problems. So uh, it's common, much, much more than people think. And your doctor probably has not ever heard of it because it was first described in 2010. Wow. If we wanted to read more about it, we should just Google it or um, I know you... Go to YouTube. No, seriously. YouTube. YouTube put in mast cell activation syndrome Dr. Afrin, A-F-R-I-N. And um, there's another one from a doctor out of Boston. Amazing. Um, and I'll just tell you just a couple instances of uh, facts. Um, it can start as young as nine. It can take as long as 40 years later to get a diagnosis and can affect people from uh, one to 99. Wow. It and is where, amazing. And where does it come from? What's causing this? We don't know. There may well be autoantibodies against the IgE. One, uh, Dr. Afrin has written an article theorizing that the microbiome is different. The T cells that I've talked about before, the T lymphocytes may be interacting with the mast cells. So if you get an autoimmune condition, that could keep on making it go and go and go. All right. Well, lots to think about. I'll let you go. I thank you so much once again for your wisdom and your insight. And I hope that everyone has taken lots and lots of notes and watches this a couple of times. And I'll put up as many links as possible so we can all continue our research. Thank you again to Dr. Leonard Weinstock. I will put the links to the LDN Research Trust and Dr. Weinstock's website in the show notes for anyone who wants to keep the learning going. Thanks for joining us and see you the next time on the SIBO SOS podcast.